Our text is taken uh, uh, to, uh, tonight from Esther, the seventh chapter. Esther, the seventh chapter. We'll read the entire chapter, but the entire chapter is only ten verses long. So, uh, and here's and here it has. So, so the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day, at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition, and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahishas answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went to the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now Bornai, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, so that he had prepared for that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. Observations. Any observations uh, tonight? So the first one I have is <clears throat> taking a ending with the, at chapter six and reading Haman at his house and his family just dissing on him. Mm -hmm. You know, using 21st century vernacular, dude, you screwed up. Yeah. You're in a world of hurt. Mm -hmm. But we skip over right away. The eunuchs came and they hurried him to, to the banquet. Then you read they came. I have to think, as I was running this through my mind, that had to be a long ride for mm -hmm. Haman. Leaving his house, going to the palace, knowing Things aren't right. I mean, as a human, we have things aren't, to use the saying my mom, you know it's not good in your soul. He had to know, even as evil and as narcissistic as he was, he had to know things weren't going good, weren't going his way. And he, he had to go now, put on a happy face in front of the king and the queen and try. And then you can almost imagine, if you read down through this, it's like, Every word is coming out of Esther's mouth. He just got to be kind of slinking lower, slower, lower, slower, down in his chair, hoping that nobody would recognize he was there. Yeah, yeah well, and uh, I really think it hit him like a truck. Oh, yeah. I really do. I don't really think that he saw the connection between Esther and Mordecai in the least bit. And so he, he could, while he could have been feeling some stress from the day, I think when he, on his way, he was like, finally, this day is over. I can sit back and party. I can sit back and, and uh, be a be a part uh, of that. I, th I think it was I think it was probably a very a very nice very nice uh, 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 situation there uh, for him. But he, like you said, once that that it, that turned around, uh, his day went from bad to worse. And then the other thing I noticed, not to capitalize on the conversation, there seems to be the writer of the letter, the story of Esther. Who, however this was told, there's always somebody in the right place at the right time. When, when the king was looking for who to magnify, Haman was right there at the court. Here, out of, there's a eunuch standing right. Guess what? There's a gallows right down the road. I, they knew all of it. Yeah. It, it, it seemed like 
Hey, God's timing was perfect. How do you think he knew about it? <clears throat> they may have helped build it. They may have helped build it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And how many of you know, have ever met anybody that was very proud and arrogant? They brag about everything. You know, they have no secrets when they think that they're going to come out on top of a situation or circumstance. And so he probably shared to them, share with them, you know, see this gal is, this gal is for, for Mordecai. He'll, he'll learn, he'll learn, you know, the, uh, yes. Um, what was I thinking? He, um, uh, I lost it. That's okay. That's all right. Back on the platform, right? <laughs> <laughs> the train will come back. In verse 5, where the king said, who is he and where is he who would do this? Like, it was his law. It was. <laughs> his ring. It, it was. It, it, it was. It was. Uh, he, he was, he was, he was, he uh, was, he was partly guilty for it, you know. Uh, uh, I think the, I think the, uh, 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 do you notice how he first responded? What did the king do when she first told him this? He had to leave the room. He had to leave the room. He went outside to get a, uh, why do you think he did that? Maybe he didn't want to appear, like, extremely angry in Esther's sight, maybe? Maybe he felt guilty. He may have felt guilty. He may have felt duped, you know, because uh, because he had given this man the power to kill his wife, you know, uh, and, to, and, to, and, and to do something that he didn't know. I, I think, too, that he realized that there would be political ramifications of killing uh, uh, Haman. Haman was basically second in the kingdom. At, the, at, the, at this point. He was trying to get his mind, I think he was trying to cool down so he could make a good decision. Then he walks back in the room and guess what? <laughs> <laughs> Went from bad to worse. Went from bad to worse. He, he, saw, he saw him over there on the couch begging Esther and that was a breach of protocol. You didn't get that close to the queen. And it just sent it, uh, uh, Xerxes into a rage. Out. I'm going to say here, <clears throat> apparently, uh, the people that were in the kingdom had been accepted, uh, and, and apparently, I, I don't think that the king knew everything about anybody's background. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yes. Esther and Haman kind of kept things under the wire, that they didn't get too uh, uh, malicious about the, promoting the fact that they were Jews, mm -hmm. and uh, that they were related. And so, if, if you've got an individual in the kingdom that's going to wipe out a whole race of people, what's he going to do later on? See? Yes, yes. Because, because apparently the kingdom had been pretty, uh, uh, pretty docile. Nobody was uprising against him. They all followed him. He accepted them for what they were, even though I, I don't think he knew half the people where they came from. Absolutely. And keep, it, keep in mind that yeah. he didn't conquer these people. Nebuchadnezzar did. Most of them were. Right, right, right. He, he basically walked in and took control of a kingdom that was already established. A, a huge mixture of, of, of people from all this empire. Because the Babylonians, their practice was if I conquer you, I'll take a group of you back to Babylon with us just to basically uh, get loyalty and, and basically to sow a little confusion. Uh, to, to, so uh, uh, and, and if they ever had any problems with you, they just took you back to Babylon so they could watch you closer. You know, uh, and, and so the Persian Empire was made up of a, of, of a huge diversity. And like you said, uh, all this hap happened before Xerxes took the throne. So Xerxes, when he looked at people, he didn't say that was a Hebrew, this one's, you know, uh, this was this. That's it. Unless somebody sat him down and said, well, these people came from this country, that one or that one. I don't think it was like that. They were kind of blended together, even though they were different. Yes. And they, they, they pledged their, uh, uh, or were afraid to rise up and mm -hmm. did what they were told. And that, and that's, that establishes peace. Mm -hmm. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to give force to mouth <laughs> when you got that's one. Right. And that's right. goes. That's right. And we've already seen that Xerxes didn't like making his own decisions. You notice that? He, he, he oftentimes liked involving counselors, which is a, it's a wise thing. 
as long as the counselors are good, you know. Uh, but 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 Haman was not a was not a good counselor. Yes. I thought it was kind of cool that you could see how God's still giving Esther favors, you know, because the moment she brings it up, the king's on her side. He's not like contesting it. He's not like, yeah, well, Haman would do that, or Haman has a good reason. You know, he mm -hmm. immediately is like, how dare you, Haman? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think also what, what David's downfall was, was that he was too smart for his own good. Now, now he wanted, and maybe he didn't, he didn't have the knowledge to, uh, about uh, who Esther and, uh, and Mordecai were, but he could have went to the king and held, had a, had a uh, private conference with him and told him that he knew of people in the kingdom that might be a problem to him later on and then pointed them out give the king uh, some time to decide whether he wanted them in there or not. If that wasn't the case, uh, he just went ahead on his own and, uh, and, and was, was he, you might say, the arresting officer, the judge, and the prosecuting attorney at the same time. And the king, he didn't like that. Yeah, uh, schemers don't usually operate in wisdom. <laughs> they tend to operate from basically selfish uh, 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 and, 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 and they wanted to keep it. He didn't want to go do it the hard way. He wanted to do it the easy way. He wanted to just go in and get a rubber stamp on this and, and go kill Mordecai. That was his, that was his desire. Yes. Um, I was thinking too how Cove brought up before how I think part of the reason the king reacted the way he did, you know, he said how he might have felt duped and stuff. I think because he had actually really trusted Haman, and then Esther tells him all that, and then when we get down a little lower, when the eunuch mentions that Haman was going to hang Mordecai, who spoke well of the king, you know, really mm -hmm. turned it around where Haman looked like a total traitor who was scheming against the king. Oh, the time. absolutely. And Haman didn't have a clue the, the mess he was getting entangled in. Because he was getting entangled in on, on every side, and it was because, basically because you know God was entangling him in, in his own devices, his own ways. Yes, um, I I basically thought of what I was thinking of earlier is that you know you said how did the eunuchs know about Haman's plan? Well, basically he did a decree to every part of the country. Well, I'm talking about with Mordecai's. The, the, oh, yeah. the gallows, the gallows. Yeah. Yeah, because that's, right. that's what the, the eunuch had said. He said, "By the way, King, he built, he just built a gallows oh, that's last, right. yeah. last last night." Yeah. Oh, and this this eunuch already knew that not only that he had built a gallows, but who it was for. Well, it's, yeah. it seems to me like the eunuchs would have been, they would have been the ones that, they would have been that character that that knew, they they had their they had their, you know, they were around the the king and the queen. But they also had to do these tasks, so they were around, you know, the servants. They were around the yeah. They weren't you know, totally isolated. Like, yeah, they weren't right. as isolated. Yeah, they would have they would have had their foot in both places, having yeah. to do the business. They knew and, the, they knew the business they, of the and, of the palace. And then some sure. of them had to have known too, who that Queen Esther and Mordecai were related, because she was passing messages to to Mordecai. So, so right. she had to have, somebody had to have known. Right. You know, yeah. and probably, probably, some of, probably some of her closest servants. That yeah. was still a very tightly kept secret. Yeah. yeah. Well, was it, Haman was over the eunuchs, wasn't he? <clears throat> no, sir. But I mean, he, if he wanted to know anything, he could find it out from whoever it was. He, he was, he had, he had the, the, he had the authority and the influence uh, to, to do that if, if, if he, if he if he if he needed to, he he knew how he knew how to he knew how to work the system, uh, you know. If he if he needed to, but the thing about it is, by the time he sat in that chair, he had no idea what was about to happen to him. He had no idea uh, who Esther was. He had no idea the connection with Mordecai. He had no idea with any of the stuff. And it just it just come out it just come out of left field. Yes. I was gonna say too, on top of Haman's pride, and probably boasting about the gallows. There's no way he could have hidden that he was building it because it's 52 foot high. Like, it is, it is. Like, you're right. taller than his own house. You're like, right. Everybody would have seen that and then started asking who's it for. You know, well, that, that's what got me because I, I looked at a thing and I don't know if it was correct or not, but it said a cubit is about 
a foot and a half, so it would have been about 75 feet high. He wanted the whole city to see I was going to say, how far does somebody have to drop before you kill them? <laughs> That's right. That's right. In the Old West, they were only about <laughs> 10 feet high. Well, here's, here, here's, historians think that it wasn't a gallows in the way we think of gallows. Okay. Historians believe that he had, that the, 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 the Persians adopted the gallows from the Assyrians, and the Assyrians impaled people. They sharpened a huge stake, and then they just dropped the person on top of the stake to just, to just, uh, to just suffer until they, until they died. So, so either way, it's not a good end. You no. know? Yeah, you know, whether it's, whether it's a, hung this way or hung this way, you know, on, on the stake. Any other observations? Oh, we're done. <laughs> What's that? And we're done. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> now we have we have we have uh, we have uh, fo we have followed uh, uh, this this story along and along, and we, we begin to we begin to see early on uh, in this story that there is a cost to surrendering to God. There is a cost. Uh, some things that we have to surrender to him uh, in our life. Esther displayed this. Uh, Mordecai displayed this. They all displayed these things. But even with the cost of surrendering, uh, basically the payback is so much better, isn't it? Uh, but the cost to standing against God, that's a totally different story. We have this cost of trying to hinder God's plan uh, that, 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 that Haman uh, had. And we're going to see the devastating results of standing before uh, uh, God and having to answer for it, even when he didn't realize that he was standing against God. That should let that serve to us as a, as a, as a warning that we should be very careful of, of how we criticize other brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, of how, how we may judge other brothers and sisters in Christ because we don't know where they are in God's plan and God's purpose. Uh, so some people would, at this point would have already said Esther was wrong because she didn't bring it up at the first banquet. That she did, what, what is she doing? Is she a coward? Uh, all, all these type of things. But as we'll see here uh, tonight, it, she was dead on. God's, God's time was perfect. Uh, all these things had to take place in the times that they take place. So she, she had, to, had to know that and to learn that uh, in, in our life. You see, uh, uh, w there's, a, there's a powerful principle that I believe that we need to grab a hold of uh, tonight. And it's, it's this principle. And it's that God's destiny doesn't just happen to your life. It happens through your life. Let me say that again. God's destiny doesn't just happen to your life. It happens through your life. Now, when, oftentimes when we think of destiny in the sense that, uh, that our, our, our common uh, culture thinks about, we think of destiny as something that's absolutely going to happen. That's not what happens in God's Word. Uh, God always gives us the option to be obedient. He always gives us the option to be a part of what he's doing. He al always wants to involve us in his plan. Mordecai said, remember what Mordecai said the other day? You might not want to do it, Esther, but God will find somebody else to do it. You know, but, but when we commit our lives to, to doing what God has called us to do, God will work through us. So we must, we must, we must be, be determined to let God work through us. So here we are at the pinnacle of this entire story. And what is the pinnacle of this entire story? Esther is called on to speak up. See, there's a message. There's a message here with, with Esther. Everything would lead up to this message. All these years, all this preparation, all her promotions, everything that was unfolding was unfolding for this singular message. Everything that will come after this will come after it as a result of this message. You see, something we need to understand is oftentimes when God calls us and he uses us, it's very important for us to realize that usually it revolves around a message. It revolves around his message. It revolves around his word. It revolves around us having a hand in spreading that message and spreading that, that gospel. That was the key to what Esther was doing there. So Esther would ultimately not become the queen. She would, Esther would become the messenger.
She would become the one that would speak the word and the will of God to Xerxes. Now, can I tell you that this text is filled with principles about being the messenger of God. Principles of wisdom, principles of grace, principles of, 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 of how we should do it, how, we, how it should, how it should uh, unfold uh, uh, in, our, in our life. Somebody, from, from looking at our text, let's go back to our text for a moment. Look at our text. Tell me something about Esther's mode, methods, style, whatever, and what can we learn from her as the messenger of God? Once again, she looks to what pleases the king. Humble. It and says, consider, and consider, right? It says, if I, if I have found favor, so she is humble, yeah. Yeah. She's humble. Oh, anything else? She's patient. She's patient. She's patient. Seems like she's been a wife for a while. She knows to be patient. Yes, Al. Also very cautious. Cautious, that's right. But it also, she says, if it pleases the king, let my life be given at my petition. That's right. So she's willing to sacrifice her life. That's right. That's right. Yes, Al. She, uh, when she says it, that if, if her and her people would have been sold as slaves, they could have accepted that. But to be annihilated for no reason at all, she, she poses a cause to the king. Oh, that's right. That's right. You guys are striking right down the line of where we're heading tonight. I love it. I love it. Any other, any other principles? Uh, that, that she teaches us about being God's mouthpiece, God's messenger. Yes, James. She's pretty strict to the point. That, that's, that's right. That's right. She's direct. In conjunction with that, she's direct in the fact that she points out the wickedness of him. Mm -hmm. That, that's, a, that's, that, that, that's right. She's specific. Honest. Mm -hmm. What's that? Honest. Honest. That's right. That's right. Just her. That, and I believe that's one reason why, why he, he so quickly embraced her word over Haman's word. Because he knew that He'd been living with this woman for five years and, and been dealing with her, and he knew that she didn't lie. She didn't make up uh, 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 things. Yes? She was open, too. She finally admitted to him that she was a Jew. That's, that's right. She was open. Anything else? I think this is, I think here's, here's one that we won't find in this text, what we find before this text, and that, it, that she, that this entire experience was spirit led. Remember, she said, I'll fast, y'all fast, uh, uh, we'll see, we'll see God. She understood that what she was about to do was so crucial that she couldn't do it on her own, that she had to be led by the Holy Spirit. There is so much wisdom in how Esther brought this message to Xerxes. So much wisdom that, that, that we can learn from and we can grow from in sharing God's word when he lays it upon our heart. Sharing God's word uh, in, in, our, in our homes, in our situation, in our jobs, in, 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 in our world. And we, we see that, that the, the call to speak up is a call that is in our lives uh, as, as, as well. Um, she understood something. Esther understood that there was not only a protocol in approaching King Xerxes, there was a protocol in talking to King Xerxes. 
She realized that if she was gonna if she was gonna accomplish what she had come to accomplish, it would mean that she would have to follow the protocols of talking with him. Tommy Tenney uh, uh, wrote a wrote a book a few years back on on Esther, and he gave, he gave the illustration in that book about about the protocol of of, uh, of 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 talking to people. He said his little girl come up to, to him one day and asked for something, and and he just said no, no, you can't have that. And he said, all of a sudden, he said, Mama come in the room and called the little girl over. And she started talking to the little girl. And she said, he said, I could just barely hear what they were talking about. She said, if you want something, honey, you got to do it right. You got to, first of all, he said, you got to spend time with Daddy. You got you to gotta, you gotta laugh. You got to enjoy your, enjoy your time with him. Then you got to sit up on his lap. You got to lean over and kiss him on the cheek. You got to say, I love you. And then when he smiles... That's when you ask him. He said, you know the funny thing? I heard all this scheming going on on the other side of the room, and I was determined that I'm going to still say no. <laughs> she, he said, but when she got to the point where she said, I love you, and she kissed me on the cheek, she said, I just couldn't help but smile. And when I did, and she asked me, she said, meaning to say no, I said yes. <laughs> she had followed the protocol of leading her father's heart. Of, 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 of directing, of directing, directing that man. She had followed the protocol of, of, of what, was, uh, what, what was appropriate at getting what she, she needed. And in much the same way, uh, Esther will follow the protocol of talking with Xerxes in such a way, in such a manner that it would, that it would, uh, that it would be transformed, transforming. Paul even knew this. Paul tells us, uh, at one point, when we speak, speak truth in love. In other words, he said, he said know, why, know how to speak the way you need to speak. Know how to bring truth to light uh, in, in, in your way. My dad used to put it this way. Boy, before your mouth is in motion, make sure your brain is in gear. What was he saying? Make sure you think and you know and you understand what you're saying. Make sure that there's wisdom in what you say. I've, I've seen people say the truth and say it in such a way that it just destroys everything they're trying to do. I've seen people say things in such a manner, in such a way, that, it, that, that, it, that completely reverses the goal that they have in mind. So let's take a look at, at, at Esther uh, uh, this, this morning, a few things about, uh, about, uh, about this uh, speaking up. First of all, we need to know why we speak up. We need to know that we, when we speak, we are speaking with a purpose in our lives. You see, uh, and I hate to say it, and I've been guilty of it too, sometimes we speak for the sake of speaking and not for the sake of having a goal. Sometimes we speak because we feel like that's our responsibility, just to say something or just, just to speak something. But the thing about Esther is Esther had a specific purpose for what she was saying. She had a specific purpose, a specific plan. Her speaking was purposeful in her life. She had a goal that she wished to accomplish. She understood why she needed to speak. And in, and in our lives, as we, as we face, face the world that we live in, we need to know the, need to know the, word, the reason that we're speaking up, the, what, the, what we wish to accomplish, if we're going to be as effective as Esther was in her time. Notice, first of all, she knew that she, she, they spoke because the situation is desperate. She understood that, that if she didn't speak, God would have to pick, get somebody else to do the speaking for her. And she understood that time was wasting. She understood that if that she had to act, she had to act now. I believe that Esther, in her fasting and her praying, had, had felt the heartbeat of God. And in feeling the heartbeat of God, she knew the situation was desperate. And she knew that it was time for her to speak up. Uh, in our life, as we seek God, as we pray, as we fast, as we seek to know his hand, may we get the heart of God so that we can, when we see others, we see the desperate situation that they're facing. 
that we see the desperate situation of their souls, that we see the desperate situation of the times that we live in, that we see how very desperate they are. We need to realize that the situation is desperate. Uh, you know, uh, we may not be in the exact same position that Esther is in, but we're in a very similar position where God puts us and plants us in the middle of our world to be able to share his word uh, uh, the way he would have for it to be shared. And then, here's, here's yet another principle. We speak because it's the very reason why we're here. I'm not just talking about the very reason why we were born into the kingdom of God. But the very reason why God has brought us to that purpose and that time and that place, oftentimes he puts us there so that we might be a mouthpiece for God. It's the reason why God made you the parent of that child. It's the reason that God made you the husband of that wife or the wife of that husband or the brother of that sister. Or, or it's the reason that God put your cubicle so closely together. It's the reason why these things are taking place. Why? Because he wants us to become mouthpieces of his grace, mouthpieces of his mercy uh, uh, again and again and again. You see, uh, we see throughout the Word of God, if you look at the Word of God, you begin to realize something. God constantly, miraculously opens doors throughout the Word of God to put people in positions that they'd otherwise not be in so that they can share a message that they otherwise wouldn't hear. Daniel, for some reason, you got an invitation to this wild, crazy party that's going on. They're calling for you right now. He walks into that party. It's not a party going on. Everybody's in stunned silence because a hand has appeared and it's written on the wall. Meany, meany, uh, uh, tecolini, I think, what, what, I think. And it was, it is basically, you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And so here was da Daniel the, sent there to, to interpret that and to give the word of the Lord to that, to that king. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, a rush before the king while they stoked the fire behind them seven times hotter. And he said, I'm going to give you another chance. Just bow before me and it'll be okay. But uh, I, I believe the message that he was there to hear is, is that our God can deliver us. And if he just doesn't choose to deliver us, neither will we bow before you, O oh king. And, and the king had them thrown into the fire furnace. He saw the fourth man himself walking around in there with him. Why were they there? They were there to share the word. They were there to share the message. When you are placed in positions of power and authority or privilege or just, just by seemingly chance, real, look for the message that God may want you to bring. Look for the word, his word, that God may want you to share. You may find yourself in a situation or a circumstance and you're like, I don't exactly know what to do. But God says, we, you need to realize why we speak, why we say what we say. Also, and I think this is important, we need to know when to speak. When to speak. This is one of the greatest acts of, of wisdom, spirit-filled wisdom, spirit-led wisdom that, that <coughs> Esther demonstrates, and that is her timing. She, uh, she functioned at the perfect time. Uh, uh, in, in, in her, the time was, was right. You see, uh, she was skilled with a very few key principles in knowing when that she needs to speak. So when is, when is that, Pastor? First of all, we need to, when the atmosphere is right. What was the banquet about anyway? It was setting the atmosphere to bring the message. It was to show the king how much Esther cared for the king. It was to show the king the honor. It was to show the king the privilege. It was to show the king to, to, to give him a, a, a wonderful setting. What was the atmosphere all about? She understood something. For my message to get through, I need to make sure that the atmosphere is right in our... She invested in that situation and circumstance. See, I think some readers, sometimes we don't win people because we don't invest in a relationship. We want to tell them about God. But there's an old saying that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. 
So in our life, we need, I believe if we develop relationships and we work with them, then we have inroads. We've developed the atmosphere. We've set the atmosphere to sharing truths with other people. They know they can trust us. They know that, that we're out for their good, not to just mark us off as another Christian. I, I, I led to the Lord. No, we need to know that we need to learn to speak when the atmosphere is, 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 has been set in, in our life. If we're not careful, we will find ourselves ruining good opportunities because we rush into something that God didn't intend for us to rush into. Get to know people. Develop those relationships. Develop the atmosphere. Sometimes God will give you the atmosphere itself. He'll put you in a situation or a circumstance where, where, uh, where, uh, where you speak specifically into a uh, to, to that person's heart and their life at that moment. We need to realize that, that, that she knew when to speak. Also, she had, she, she knew uh, when the time is right. Now, I use the word perfect, that that was the perfect time. But can I tell you, if you're waiting for the perfect time, It'll never come because the perfect time uh, is up to your up, up to your discretion. It's up to when you define it as the perfect time. Oh, you know, well, the Lord's done this; He's opened this door. But mm, I don't know about this. This might happen, or that might. We can talk ourselves out of speaking up for God. Remind me of of, of a story uh, one uh, pastor told of a man in his church that 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 uh, that that one morning he got up and he prayed. He said, "Lord," he said, "Would you?" Give me a sign if you want me to test witness or testify to somebody. Just give me a sign, Lord, Lord God. So he goes and he gets on the city bus and he sits there and as he's sitting on the bus, all of a sudden this this big, huge, tattooed construction worker come walking down the aisle, kind of gruff looking and and plops down beside him and and and, and the, the man sitting there thinking, oh boy, this is uncomfortable. I'll be glad when I can get off this bus. All of a sudden, the man burst out crying and he's sobbing, sitting in the back. And the man looks over at him. He looks at the man and he says, I'm a lost sinner. I need to, I need to know Jesus. Can you help me? The man bowed his head and said, Lord, is this a sign? <laughs> you know, that's, that's almost the way we do, right? Sometimes it's, 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 too, it's, you know, Lord, Lord, all the things are in place. You see, the time may not be perfect, but there are times that are right. Esther realized that the time was right. She, 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 put, she put forth an effort to make sure that the time was right. It will take courage. It will take, it'll take discernment. It will take us looking at our situations and our circumstances and allowing God uh, to, to speak through it. Also, we gotta, we got to know when the moment presents itself. There, there, there's, those, there's those moments that present. It takes great discernment uh, to, to do that. Uh, 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 you know, Esther didn't have to wonder when that moment was present because God aligned, aligned it so much. Can I, did you notice that the king asked her the same question three times? You notice that? Mm -hmm. She answered it one time. She answered it the third time. She, under, she understood when the time in was right. Now, you wives know that. Husbands, have you ever, have you ever asked your wife, you know something's not right. And you say, what's wrong? And they go, nothing. And you know, you know that that nothing is not, is not the whole truth of, about the matter. What they are doing is they're checking the temperature. They're checking to see how open you are to, to hearing what they want to say. They're checking to see if that moment has presented itself. She knew that third time that when Xerxes asked her that he meant it with all of his heart, he, had, he didn't have a belly full of wine, he, he, he was, he was, it was before everything had got started, we got to be able to recognize that moment when things are right. How do we do that? We do that through the, uh, through the Holy Spirit's discerning. We do that through allowing the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom in those situations or those circumstances. We got to know when to speak, just like Esther uh, knew, knew when to speak. Now, now here's, here's, a, here's another principle that we, we need to grab a hold of. We know, need to know where to start speaking. We need to know where to start speaking. 
Uh, you see, the wording of Queen Esther is masterful. If you look at these wordings, we've already kind of scratched the surface of what, of what uh, Queen Esther said, how she said it, how she went about it. It was masterful because she understood some very powerful principles of communicating. It revealed to, her, uh, to, her, to her, the king her humility. It, it revealed to the king her honesty. It revealed to uh, her, her king her, her, uh, her dignity. It, it, it showed so much in what she had to say. So, so she knew where to start in what she said. First of all, she knew she needed, she needed to make, meet him where he was. Right where he was. Notice what it said in verse, verse number three. Then Queen Esther answered and said, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. She didn't start with her need. She started with his need. She started with pointing out his favor, pointing out what pleases the king. She met him where he was at. He was, I'm sure he was intrigued. I'm sure he was sitting on the edge of his seat. What in the world does she want? I, I've been asking her and asking her, what in the world does she want? There's a key principle there for us. If you want to reach somebody for Christ, determine where they're at. Determine what a need is in their life. Determine the situation or circumstance that they're going through. And then start there. Start in that circumstance. Start, oh, oh they're, they're lonely. Start there. Oh, they're addicted. Start there. Oh, that they wrote the situations and circumstances. She started right where he was at. I, I, I like that. I like that. His, uh, she, she, she poured into his life. She identified his need, and then, he, then she began to speak to that need to, to, to start with. Too often, one, one time, too often we have our own little, sad to say too often, our, our, our witnessing is more our list of how it is supposed to be done instead of a conversation. We need to have, make, have more conversations with people. We need to understand where they're at, what they need, what their situation is, where they're coming from. And it's at that point that we can launch. We need to know where to start. She also involved him in the process. I, I like that. This was, in fact, the conversation for her. She, 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 uh, she, she wanted him to think through what she was telling him. She, he, she wanted to present it to him and walk him through it, but not walk him through every little detail in the life. She wanted to present the truth to him. She was going to be considerate and respectful of his concerns. Listen to, listen to how she said it. For we have been sold. Now, listen to how she describes what, is, what, what has happened to her people. And she drew a picture for him to see what was going on. She said, we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. All three of them. Have we, had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. She walked him through it. She said, if it had been a lighter matter, I wouldn't have brought it to your attention. <laughs> If it would have been a lighter matter, I would, have, I would have moved on. But because of its seriousness of it, I'm involving you, King. I'm, I'm, I'm showing you the seriousness of it. I'm showing you the, the depth of it. I'm showing you the situations of it. See, she was willing uh, to, 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 to start right there. She, she also, and I'm so glad so many of you have already pointed out many of the things we, we, we looked at. She sacrificed herself for the message. She, 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 she sacrificed for, for, for the message. She, she said, she said if, uh, uh, notice, notice here, said, for we, if, for we have been sold in my people and I to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. She included herself in that lineup. She was, she was telling the king who she was, what she was, her involvement in this process, giving the king the option that if you choose otherwise, I'm gone. If you choose otherwise, I'm dead. See, too often in our life, if we're not careful, we're not willing to lay aside our flesh to be able to speak the truth to others. Probably one of the biggest things 
that keeps us from talking about Jesus Christ to others is a fear that we're going to be rejected. It's a fear that we're going to be mocked. A fear that we're going to be. But that's when it's time to die to ourselves, to lay the flesh aside, and to speak honestly and openly to other people. That's where we start. We start with a dead flesh and a living spirit in our life. We start with that place where we have been crucified so that we can speak to, to what God wants us uh, to speak to. And then she got to the point. Oh, I like that. She didn't go into a lot of detail. She didn't go tell, tell, tell him every little thing that Haman had done. But she, she simply got to the point. Notice what, notice what that point was in verse 5. So King I hear her says, answered and said to the queen, Who is he and where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and Queen. She got to the point. She 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 didn't she didn't dwell on it. She didn't she didn't do a lot of a lot of uh, additional talking. She made her point. She said it. She got to the point. Too often, if we're not careful, we beat around the bush. Too often, we're afraid to say what we what we truly need to say. Uh, there's something to be said for bold honesty. There's something to be said for just simply speaking to the point. We need to know where to start. When we start speaking, we need to look at the situation. We need to know the heart of the people that we're talking, talking to. We need to start at that point. But here's another very valuable, and I think it's probably even, even as important as where to start. We need to know where to stop speaking. My dad gave me three points when I was first preaching. He said, son, when you preach, you got to remember three things. Stand up, speak up, and then shut up. He said all three of them are vitally, vitally important. We need to understand that too uh, in our life. We need to know when to stop speaking. We need to know when to shut our mouths, really. In, in, the, middle, in the middle of, that's a very rare talent, isn't it? <laughs> to know when to stop speaking. Esther had to know when to stop speaking. Uh, because I think it was uh, crucial to her, crucial to what God wanted. You see, when you make your case, stop talking. After we've said what we needed to say, give it a rest. Leave it there. That's what, that's what, uh, that, that's what was going on. Do you notice what she did after she said this to Xerxes and Xerxes left the room? She did not follow the man. She didn't go chasing after Xerxes to make one more point. When Haman was begging her, what did she say to Haman? Nothing. She had said her piece. She had spoken what she needed to speak. She had made her case and she left it there. Why did, was she, did she leave it like that? Why did she hold her tongue like that? What was, what was the motivating factor of her not saying anything else? Simply, she trusted God with the rest. She trusted that God would accomplish with what she had done what needed to be done next. And oh, did he. She just sat there and watched it all unfold, didn't she? Haman. Didn't chase after Xerxes either. You know why he didn't chase after Xerxes? First of all, he was scared to chase after Xerxes. Secondly, he knew the influence in the room was sitting on the couch. She had the control. Yes. Well, the uh, rule that you didn't appear before the king unless he summoned you to still applied here. Mm -hmm. If he went after him, he had probably been dead before they took him out. That, that, that's, that's right. He would have probably crossed that line, that protocol line. He still crossed the protocol line, but he just didn't understand. I want to mention something else here. Uh, when she talked about, uh, well, we've been sold by people and I to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Uh, and on down here it says, uh, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss, 
Now, you have to kind of go back in history to, to, to understand what she was saying here. When the Jews were slaves in Egypt, it's believed that they helped, they, they uh, pushed Egypt's industrialization, if I give a common today word for an ancient time, mm -hmm. far beyond what the other nations were. But they helped Egypt stay a power, a world power. Right, right. Because God had instilled in, in many of those people all the skills that were prominent for that day uh, in time. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think Iran, or what is modern day Iran, which was then the uh, uh, Persian Medes Empire, I think they've done the same thing there as they did for Nebuchadnezzar because they had all these skills. Right, right. right? And, and, so and she also, made a, she, yeah. she, made a, she made a very prominent and honest statement when she said that. That's right. And also remember Haman's first promise to the king concerning this. I'll pay for it all. Yeah. I'll give you all this money. She was, in, in one sense too, she was saying, I know what your conversation was. <laughs> I know what, what he promised you. I know, what, I know, what, was, I know what, what was going on behind closed doors. I know the details uh, of it all. And I believe it was, I believe it was, I believe it was part of the, the whole thing that stirred this king up to a rage in her life. But, when she, but by the time she got to this point, she had just basically handed it off to God and said, said, said Lord God, uh, uh, here, here it is. So, and here he goes. Haman does the stupidest thing you can possibly do. He falls over on the couch with Esther, begging her. And oh, that was what, what he should do. He comes into the room, Xerxes comes into the room and said, you're going to assault my wife in front of me? And the guards didn't even have to wait for the next instructions. They grabbed the, they grabbed the cloth and they covered his face. You know what that meant in Persian Empire? You will never see the king's face again. You're, you're, you're a dead man, basically. Uh, you know, you, 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 have no, you have no honor, you, you're, you're disgraced. So he covered his face. Th then, all of a sudden, th th to win the favor, uh, th this, this eunuch steps up. Now, Tabernacle, one of the eunuchs said to the king, look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf. Man, Jesus is really, really burying uh, Haman here, uh, is standing in the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him on. Just like that. Do you remember how his day started? He started skipping to the palace to tell the king, King, let's, uh, you know, I, I need your, your help to, to deal with the problem that I have. And that day snowballed. He's called in the king. Uh, he, he, he helps the king plan for great honor of Mordecai. He spends that entire day doing nothing that he wanted to do and everything that he had paid for. His life, his decisions, all these things were coming down to this moment. Why? Because the messenger spoke up. The messenger allowed the Holy Spirit to speak God's will into that circumstance, into that situation, to, to use the wisdom. I, I, often I use that, often I use that, that quote uh, where, where Jesus tells his disciples, when you stand before kings and rulers, don't worry about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit's going to tell you what to say. I believe what he was trying to do is teaching them how to function and to operate, being spirit-led the way God would have for them to be, to be led. So we need, to, we need to know how and where to stop speaking. He was hung. This was a final act of, of judgment. And because Esther was willing to be obedient to what God has for her life. I'm not a gifted speaker. Neither was Esther. There's no other place in the scriptures where it said Esther made any kind of speech, did any kind of, uh, any kind of, uh, any kind of delegating, any kind of, any kind of speaking uh, uh, in, in this manner, especially toward the, toward the king. But when God gave her this opportunity, she stepped up. And with boldness and confidence, she said what God would have for her to say. God wants to use you. 
but part of him using you will be the, what you say. Part of him using you will, will if it, very much like Esther, will revolve around the message. Why? Because Christianity revolves around the word. Christianity revolves around God's word and us being, being uh, the uh, standard for, for his word. Speak up. That was the, the message that, that, that he had for, for, for Esther. Anything else that you, that you notice that you want to add? Any questions? Any comments? Well, we're glad you come out tonight. We really are. We appreciate you being a part of this, this study. Uh, like I said, there's going to be two more, two more studies uh, uh, the, the next two weeks, and we'll be wrapping up wrapping up uh, the, this story of Esther and, 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 and gleaning more. It's been a rich story. It really has. God's, God's words has been, been rich in, in the telling of us. And, and one of the rich things is how, it, how much it, it truly applies to our own lives and our own hearts. So God bless you. We appreciate you. Thanks for coming out.